Good morning, everybody. Good morning, and welcome to Plants Park Baptist Church on this beautiful sunny morning. Is it warm enough for you all? Yeah. Okay, that's good. That's good. So, obviously, we've got windows and doors open here. I hope those people watching at home, a big welcome to you, whether you're watching now um, on YouTube or on Catch Up during the week. Uh, if you uh, want to get in touch with the church, you can find a contact button on our website, um, and uh, the details will be scrolling at the end of the, the service this morning. So, as we come this morning... Um, and as it's nice and hot, uh, we will be doing some gentle songs and some not so gentle songs. So I hope you can bear with us on those. So let's stand before the Lord this morning. And we've got a call to worship here. Can you join in with the words that are in red on the screen? God's faithful love endures forever and ever. Because God's everlasting goodness, we offer our thanks and praise. God's faithful love endures forever and ever. Because God's care and concern for humanity, we offer God our thanks and praise. God's faithful love endures forever and ever. Because God's transforming power actions, we gather as a community of faith and trust in God, and we offer God our thanks and praise. Amen. So I'm going to be leading the first part of the service this morning, and then Steve will be coming up later uh, to uh, give us the message. But let's start with some a time of praise and worship. And uh, we're going to do three songs. They will proceed unannounced. Uh, we're going to start with Praise is Rising. And after that, we're going to sing Jesus, Hope of the Nations. And then we're going to finish this section up with Faithful One, So Unchanging.
you are so faithful, you are so unchanging. And we know that when we call out to you, that you will be hearing us and you will be listening to us. And we praise you, Lord. Amen. Please be seated. And now we're going to have our reading this morning, which is from Ruth. They were from the Ephrathran family of Bethlehem in Judea. The family travelled to the hill country of Moab and stayed there. Later, Naomi's husband, Emilach, died. So only Naomi and her two sons were left. Her sons married women from the country of Moab. One's wife was named Ophra, and the other wife's name was Ruth. They lived in Moab for about ten years. Then Mahlon and Kilion also died. So Moab was left alone without her husband or her two sons. While Naomi was in the country of Moab, she heard that the Lord had helped his people. He had given food to his people in Judah. So Naomi decided to leave the hill country of Moab and go back home. Her daughter-in-laws also decided to go with her. They left the place where they had been living and started walking back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi told her daughters-in-law, Each of you should go back to your mother. You have been very kind to me and my sons who are now dead. So I pray that the Lord will be just as kind to you. I pray that the Lord will help each of you to find a husband and a good home. Naomi kissed the daughters-in-law, and they all started crying. Then the daughters said, But we want to come with you and go to your family. But Naomi said, No daughters, go back to your own homes. Why should you go with me? I can't have any more sons to be your husbands. Go back. I am too old to have a new husband. Even if I thought I could marry again, I could not help you. If I became pregnant tonight and had two sons, you would have to wait until they grew to become men before you could marry them. I cannot make you wait that long for husbands. That would make me very sad. And I'm already sad enough. The Lord has done many things to me. So again they cried. Then Ophra kissed Naomi goodbye, but Ruth hugged her and stayed. Naomi said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her own people and her own gods. You should do the same. But Ruth said, Don't force me to leave. Don't force me to go back to my own people. Let me go with you. Where you go, I will go. Wherever you sleep, I will sleep. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Thank you. Good morning. Shall we pray together as we come to look and reflect on God's word this morning? So, Lord Jesus, thank you for this wonderful day in which we worship you and praise you and bless you. Thank you for the freedom that we have to read your word. And as we reflect upon it now together, I pray that you will speak through all that has been prepared into our hearts and speak into our lives, we pray. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you feel excited about coming to church this morning? Yeah, excellent. You're awake today. Cool. I felt I felt excited about coming to church this morning because uh, I've really enjoyed sort of beginning this sort of short series of stories uh, of faith, and I'm excited today because I would describe today's story uh, about Ruth as being a big message in a small story. And yet, whilst I'm excited 
about being here this morning. I have to say, preparation for today has been a real struggle, especially with how to begin this talk. Because I kind of got two options. You know when you read those books and you can make decisions as you go through a book? I thought I need to do that this morning because I've got two options this morning. One was to start with a really good mother-in-law joke. Okay. And the other is to talk about the content of this envelope. Both would be great introductions to what I want to say uh, this morning. So I guess it's one of those things. I'll let you decide which option we go. Option one is the absolutely amazing mother-in-law joke. Okay. Option number two is the contents of this envelope. So if you want option number one, cheer now. Option number two. Option one. Option two. Both. Both it is then. Let's go for both. So option number one, if it was mother-in-law joke, I would talk to you about. Have you ever noticed that uh, that people start talking about mother-in-laws, they say, let me tell you about my mother-in-law, don't they? And you always know that what's going to follow is something quite negative. For mother-in-laws, there was a Les Dawson thing on television the other day. And he used to tell stories about his mother-in-law, didn't he? Yeah, and and he stopped telling stories about his mother-in-law because apparently they were inappropriate. Uh, But his mother-in-law said, keep telling them. But I thought, well, should I tell a mother-in-law joke? But, uh, you know, mother-in-law's become a ridicule of a lot of things. And my mother-in-law is no different. So I'll have to tell her to watch this back on YouTube. And, uh, but here is one of my favourite mother-in-law jokes. And it's this. The question you ask to start with is, what's the definition of mixed emotions? And the answer is, when you see your mother-in-law backing off a cliff in your new sports car. That's going to sink in now, isn't it, as you go around? And yet, whilst whilst we might make fun of our mother-in-laws, in the book of Ruth, we find quite the opposite, don't we? Because Ruth, as we shall see this morning, loved her mother-in-law. Naomi isn't an object of ridicule. It says she's the object of love and care, concern and faithfulness. I got a bit worried then, because Maxine started walking from the front to the back, back to the front, and I was thinking, just told a joke about her mother. But she sat down, it's okay. Option number two would have been the content of this envelope. And um, I have to say, this begins with a story, thinking about uh, someone who, a guy who went to university, desperate to pass a theology PhD, because he wanted to be called a doctor. And, uh, and uh, this story goes like this, that one day, having passed and got his PhD, a friend who was passing the town where he lived knocked on the door of the family house, uh, thought he'd visit. And the 10-year-old son opened the door. And so the friend, in quite a joking manner, just said, is the doctor in? And the little boy went, yeah, but he's not the sort of doctor who'll do you any good. <laughs> so much theology, isn't it? So the contents of this letter, what does it contain? Well, we, you know, you get, you get a doctor, you get a PhD, you, get, uh, you do a degree, you get other letters after uh, your name uh, and so forth. And uh, there's lots of things about letters. And at the beginning of my title, I have Reverend. And that can be quite handy at times because just the title Reverend can open some sort of doors and start some sort of conversations that other people don't always have. But in this envelope is my letter of accreditation from the Baptist Union of Great Britain. Now, this says, this is a certificate in one sense. You know, if you ever go to the Baptist Assembly, uh, and in the old days, you used to walk past and get your handshake, and they give an envelope. This is what is in the envelope, if you've ever wondered, okay? And uh, this is a certificate. It says, it confirms me as a Baptist, accredited Baptist minister. It says that I've completed a college course and probation studies or newly credited minister studies. It kind of says that I've gone through countless interviews and that I've been certified. Certified as okay (laughs) to be a minister in the Baptist Union of Great Britain. I'm authorised. It's as though the Baptist Union of Great Britain have placed a stamp of approval on my head. And yet, there's a flaw in this certificate. Because it's dated 2002. 
And yet I was inducted as a Baptist minister uh, at Wexton Baptist Church in January 1996. So, does that mean between 1996 and 2002, I was a rubbish minister? Does that mean that between 1996 and 2002, I, I wasn't really, I wasn't worthy? Does it mean that my, my ministry didn't actually mean anything? I'd say no. Because what really matters isn't actually the accreditation letter of the Baptist Union, although it means I can apply to churches that are in the Baptist Union. What matters most is that God's calling and means that God has pla pla placed his stamp of seal of approval on me. And I guess another way of thinking about this story this morning is that this is a story about someone who God has placed his seal of approval on. We're looking at, if you haven't worked out, we're looking at Ruth today. <clears throat> Ruth is one of only two women who have an Old Testament book named after them. The other, of course, is Esther. Esther. Well done. Excellent. Uh, and Ruth is also one of only three women named in the genealogy of Jesus. See, God has placed his seal of approval on her, and therefore looking at her life is really important. And so there's four chapters in this book of Ruth, hence I've called it A Big Message in a Short Story. And I just want to focus on two messages in the, in the whole of Ruth's story. Uh, and the first is this. The me first message is all about Ruth's loyalty. As we heard in Ruth chapter 1, in the days when the judges led Israel, there was a famine. And so Naomi and her husband left Israel and went to, to Moabite and, uh, and into Moab. And, and they lived there because there were food. Their sons married Moabite women, but then uh, Naomi's husband and her two sons died. And that's kind of where we begin to pick up this story in, in chapter 1. And, and, and there's a famine now, even in Moab. But they, she hears, Naomi hears, there's food back in Israel. And so she says, there's nothing that's going to be any good to me because I'm a widow and there's nobody to look after me. I need to go back to Israel. And she knows that taking her two daughters-in-law who would be foreigners in Israel is, is not the ideal. And so she says, you stay here. And then there's all this crying that goes on. One of the daughters stays. But right at the end of that reading, after all the you stay, you stay, and all I'm going, Ruth says something that is so, so powerful. She makes this vow. She says, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you sleep, I will sleep. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Ruth, in those words, shows amazing loyalty, not just to Naomi, but also to God. Why? Because she knows that God actually will take care of her, whatever her circumstances. I wonder, what do we trust in today? Where do our hopes what about people in our society, around us, our community? Where does their hope really lie? Well, I brought some items with me this morning that might help us think about that just, just a wee bit because I thought, well, I bought a car. Some people trust in their possessions, don't they? That that that's kind of gives them their identity. That that will get them through whatever it is. And, and um, I was watching... Have you ever seen those programmes, Rich Family, Poor Family? Yeah, I, I kind of downloaded one on my five the other day, and, and this chap was saying, um, oh, whenever I get a bit sad, I just go and buy a new sports car, <laughs> and things like that. You know, or a really expensive watch. He traced, he placed his trust is all in his possessions. If it's not in his possessions, then it's in his money, isn't it? It's a bit of a shame that we live in England, because if we lived in America written on the back of dollar notes are the words in God we trust I thought you might have known that in God we trust as just says I promise to pay the bearer you know and it's ironic isn't it that in God we trust but actually 
written on American money, but they trust in their money more than they might decide to trust in God. So some people will trust in... I'm putting that back in my pocket. Some people will trust in their possessions. Let's leave that back on the table. Others will trust in um, uh, one of these. They trust in luck. This is a fortune cookie. And uh, they'll trust in luck. They'll read things They'll read things like fortune cookies and... I can't get into it. Horoscopes and that sort of thing. Let's just uh, see what my... my oh, I've written that one. Okay. You're going to be blessed by a short talk this morning. Oh, well, we can't trust everything we read in a fortune cookie, can we? <laughs> there we go. But they'll read the horoscopes or they'll use their fortune cookie or, or they'll, they'll gamble and, and roll dice because that's games of luck and games of chance, isn't it? And they'll say that all my hope is built in those sort of things. So it's, it's built on, on luck and what we wish and that sort of thing. Others will place their hope and their tr- hello uh, <laughs> trust in themselves. And they'll say, I'm not going to rely on anybody else. I'm just going to rely on me. Is it good looking, people in there? Yeah, yeah. yeah you see, you see what I'm looking at. Something's really good looking, isn't it? Yeah. Or if they don't place trust in themselves, they place their trust in their family. And Katie said, What are you doing with a picture of us at church? I said, I've got it out of the cupboard to bring to church this morning. <laughs> Our family, but there are times when family let us down. We trust in lots of different things. And then I've got a frog. And whilst there are a lot of things there that people trust in, we shouldn't be trusting in those things ultimately. But the frog gives us a different lesson. How do you spell frog? F R O G. Four letters F R O G, which could stand for fully rely on. God. See, there's a message in a frog. You're amazed at that, aren't you? I know, I can tell. Really? You'd rather read your fortune cookie. But, but the frog reminds us to, to fully rely on God. And I have to be honest, if I take the message of the book of Ruth, then actually, isn't that what she does? She fully relies on God. And, and that's the first message, this big message in a short story, that whatever our circumstances, trust in God. This week I was speaking to a lady who uh, told me that she finds it hard to believe in God when family members and others around her uh, are sick and going through all sorts of problems. And yet, friends, we're not called to trust in God just when things are going good. We're called to trust in God whatever the circumstances. And actually, as we talked together, I said... Actually, maybe trusting God is about having the strength that even in those difficult moments, God is with us to get us through those hard times. Big message in a short story, fully rely on God. If nothing else, just remember, frog, okay? Then we go we go through the book of Ruth to chapter 2. And uh, here in chapter 2, Ruth goes out into the fields. She picks the leftover grain to provide for her mother-in-law. And uh, she's accidentally picked on a field that belongs to a man named Boaz, who happens to be a distant relative of Naomi. And so Naomi's quite happy about this. Boaz shows favour to Ruth, and Naomi praises the Lord for leading Ruth to Boaz's field. And then we get to chapter 3, because um, I want to get to chapter 4. But in chapter 3, we kind of, Naomi realises that Ruth needs to find a husband. This is the first, ma- first matchmaking app, really, isn't it, that ever goes on. It's in the Bible. She realises Ruth needs a new husband, and Boaz is the perfect suited partner. And so she sets up a few things for Ruth. Uh, she sends Ruth to go and visit Boaz at the threshing floor and and to sit at his feet. It's a way of Ruth making it known to Boaz that she's available, that she's able to be married. And she's kind of flirting just that little bit with him. 
And Boaz gives Ruth some extra grain to take back to Naomi. Now that's flirting back in it, yeah? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to say much more about chapter 3, okay, except things are beginning to start here. And uh, so let me come to chapter 4. And, and chapter 4, if you kind of think about how the Bible's written, chapter 1 is all about death and hopelessness. Chapter 4, on the other hand, is about life and hope and blessing. The long and short of it is, is Boaz agrees to become the kinsman redeemer. In other words, he agrees to, to marry Ruth and, and take on all the debt and all the wealth that might exist for that family, but also take on Naomi and all that she means, the hardship and the, 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 the impact that she'd have uh, on the family. He agrees to do that, but then they realise there's a closer relative, someone who is more suited, who has to have first option. And at first this chap says, yeah, I'll have all the land that you've got. But then he realises that involves marrying a Moabite woman and having Ruth as a widow. And actually that waters down all of his inheritance for his own kids that he's already got. And so he says no. And Boaz is able to step up and marry Ruth and become a kinsman redeemer. They have children who they're part of the genealogy of Jesus. In fact, they're part of not just the future king of, Israel, or king of Israel, David's line, but also the Messiah himself. Just in this chapter 4, there are big messages in a short story. Firstly, the actions of the Redeemer. Boaz, unlike the other relative, he's not just a man of words, he's a man of action. That nearest relative could have taken all the wealth that was potentially there when the jubilee happened and the land would return, but he didn't want, as I say, water down his own inheritance for his own family. But Boaz was a man of action, not just words. God, likewise, is not just a God of words, is he? God doesn't just sit in heaven and say, well, I love people, I've created people. Isn't it amazing? They've done wrong, but I'm just going to carry on loving them. God did something about it. He was prepared to pay the price which was to send Jesus to die on a cross for your sin and for mine so that we could be saved and know God. And Boaz is there to reflect the actions of God as our Redeemer, of God as your Redeemer. Second message is the acceptance of all to the Redeemer. Ruth was a Moabite, and we know that through history, Jews and the Moabites, they didn't get on. They were at battle with one another, and yet what happens, God welcomes her into his kingdom, and God uses her as part of his plan. And as a reminder to us, whatever our background, whatever our colour, whatever our gender, God welcomes us to him to be part of his family. We're all called to be children of God. And God stands there with his open arms. I think I've got the image there of the prodigal son in my mind as I put up in there. Open arms, ready to greet us. Because he welcomes us. This morning as we come in worship, God was here in open arms, ready to greet you. In worship. To hold you and to love you. And coming to a welcoming God isn't about just being welcomed by God on a Sunday, but it's about spending every day walking with God, in relationship with God. And so the big message in a short story is relevant today, that, that God isn't just here on a Sunday, but God is with us in our everyday living that God is constructing, if you like, his grand story out of the small and seemingly inconsequential stories of our everyday lives. What you might think don't matter to you, it matters to God. Because he's interested in every part of your life. And just as for Ruth, this, this, the story of Ruth is framed as in part of the whole of the Old Testament. And this is four chapters in the whole of the Old Testament. This is an overall part of an overall bigger story uh, of God at work in people's lives. We have to enter each day knowing, trusting that even in those small moments, even in those difficult moments, even in the dramatic moments, 
that, that God is always fashioning out his plan and his purpose for our lives and for the world. And so everything that happens in your life, you might think is a small story, but each are a big message that God loves you, that God cares for you, that God walks with you. So may the story of Ruth remind us that there's nothing we face where God is not with us and where God can't use our everyday circumstances to bring transformation for him. Let's bow our heads, shall we, as we pray together. Maybe just as we bow our heads, think about this last week that's just gone. What events in your life have you struggled with this last week? What's been hard? Lord, as we think of those, we ask that as we look back, you will help us to see those events with your eyes and your heart. To see where you have been with us in those moments. And help us to see how you will use those moments to bring, out, bring about more of your kingdom here on earth. For the conversations we have had this week and the conversations that we will have as we go into this week ahead. Those small moments, the small things. Lord, be with us in all of those we pray. That they become part of this bigger picture that you are at work. And use those small moments, Lord, to, to help others to understand your love, your grace, your mercy, and the hope that we have in you. And so we thank you that you are our Redeemer. Thank you that you stand today with your arms, not just welcoming us, but your arms around us. We may be your people. So Lord, may we come to you. May we come before your throne and acknowledge you to be our saviour and our king. As we come before your throne of grace, pour out your love and your goodness upon us, we pray. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing prayerfully together in response to that. Lord, I come before your throne of grace. I find rest in your presence and fullness of joy. And the chorus goes on to say, what a faithful God have I. And we can sing at that as a prayer. One, if we know God's faithfulness, that we are just worshipping God for his faithfulness. And, and actually, if you struggle with that, just, just declare God is faithful and, and be prayerful, saying, may these words be true in your life as we walk with God. So for those who are able, shall we stand as we sing together?
seated. Let's bow our heads as we continue just in prayer together. We think about God's faithfulness to us. We also want to pray for God's faithfulness within our own lives, the lives of those around us, but also within our world. But let's just, as we have our heads bowed, firstly just think about our church family. And there are those within our fellowship who are struggling at this moment. There's a message that came in at the beginning of this service that a member of our fellowship was taken into a and this morning. And so we pray for those who are unwell. We pray for those who have struggled with poor health, whether it's physical or, or emotional health, and we pray for healing in their lives. And we pray as a family for your blessing to be upon them and that as we rally around one another that we may truly be a source of strength and hope. We pray that for members of our own family as well. Perhaps there are those who you know need God's touch today. It's just in your heart, name them before the Lord. That may touch their lives and whatever their needs bring transformation. May those small moments be an echo of that big message of your love. And then we think of the issues that are going on in our world. With global warming and the issues with flooding in some places and, and drought and fires in others. We just pray that as humanity we have the wisdom to sort this out. And the insight and the willingness to do that. And for those who today face devastation of having lost everything. Father God, may the churches in those places be an expression of your love into their daily lives, we pray. For those who live with fear from war, for those who are refugees, we pray for your strength and your help to be upon them, we ask. For we thank you that you are the God of refugees, just as you were with, with Ruth as she, a Moabite woman, came back into Israel. So may you welcome all refugees and help us as a nation, as individuals, to welcome those around us. Do not be afraid to do that. But we pray for peace in those places of conflict. Again, we pray for peace in Ukraine. And the impact that, that the war there is, ha is having on the cost of living for so many, Lord, not just in this country, but on the third world countries as well. We pray for change. And so, Father God, reach your hand into this world and bring your hope, we ask. Lord, for, the, for Sam and Rushley, Lord, and we, we pray, continue to pray for the freedom of, of speech and the freedom of religion. And so we pray and stand against those who would seek to take away the lives of others. For we thank you for the freedom that we have in this nation to read your word, to preach your word, to live out our faith. So help us to do that each and every day, we pray. For we ask this in the precious name of Jesus, that we may influence those north, south, east and west. In Jesus' name, amen. May we be people of faith. May we be people of influence. And shall we stand as we sing together?
Do be seated. A little smile came to my face then when it said, we've been through fire, we've been through rain. We could do with going through a little bit of rain. I think we've got some coming this week, which would be really helpful. Just a couple of notices uh, before we use our closing words um, together. Just say tea and coffee. Well, cold drinks, probably more preferable, uh, are being served uh, in a moment. Please uh, do grab one and continue our time of fellowship uh, with one another uh, together. Also, I just want to remind you that in the foyer, there are a selection of handmade cards uh, available, um, made by the So Crafty Group. So they've been meeting on the 2nd and 4th, um, Saturday of the month, 10 till 12, been making loads of cards. So do go and have a look. It's cards for all occasions. And if you think of an occasion they've not made a card for, have a chat and they'll make you one, I'm sure. Um, that's the challenge, isn't it? Um, but the cards are in the foyer out there. Please go and have uh, a look at, at those. Um, this evening, those who want to join with the Reimagine for Western, which is part of our Baptist family, so our other Baptist churches in the town coming together. We're going to meet at six o'clock outside the Tropicana and uh, walk along towards a little way on a little route ending back up at the Tropicana um, praying for our town and for one another uh, as well so um, if you're able to join us on that you're welcome to bring water bring money for your ice creams and other stuff bring suntan lotion bring hats and what have you if you don't want to do the whole walk then uh, you're able just to we've got some sheets you'll be able to just uh, find a chair and sit with a couple of other folk and, and sit and pray as the others then come back uh, as well. It's not a huge distance, so you're walking no further than Cabot Circus. Um, not Cabot Circus. <laughs> that's in Bristol, isn't it? Um, what's the Cabot Hotel? The Cabot Hotel, that's the furthest uh, distance walking from the Tropicana. Um, so we're meeting at six uh, this evening. Uh, men's group, you've got a, um, what do you call it, a barbecue? That's on Tuesday this week, isn't it? So I think you, if you don't know about those, speak to somebody who looks like the man and I'm sure they'll tell you the other details. They'll ask me because I don't know them. But um, that's on Tuesday this week. Uh, and then we have next Sunday, we've booked in a picnic. Um, I didn't look too far ahead with the forecast at the moment. It should be good again by next Sunday, is that right? Who's looked that far ahead? Yeah, in faith, it'll be good again by next Sunday. We'll have another heat wave. Um, so uh, bring uh, your picnic, bring a picnic chair. Um, and we'll meet in the park uh, after the service. Um, if you don't want to bring your own picnic, there's the cafe uh, in the park uh, as well. But again, hats, creams, everything else, uh, and so forth. Uh, and then just to remind you, as I said last week, if you are able to help with anything that for food bank, particularly tin soup, but they are um, short, of food, getting short of some stuff, then please bring that, put it in the foyer, and we'll take that to them uh, on the warehouse on the Monday. So please just think about that if you're able to, or if you're shopping, they do have the food bank bins in the supermarkets, just use those. That would be really helpful to support our community uh, around us as well. I think that's the last one. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you if, you, if you're able to stand with me as we use our closing blessing for this morning. Uh, thank you to those who have been here. Thank you to those watching uh, online as well. Especially thank you to those at Abigate, who I know watch faithfully each uh, and every week uh, as well. And I know you'll join in with us with these words as well. So if you would speak the words in red. Just as God's word was sent into the world to heal and redeem, so God sends you into the world this day to be light and love, healing and hope. We go to be light for the world. And may the grace and peace of God, the creator, the redeemer and the sustainer, Come upon us this day and remain with us always. Amen. Amen. Thank you.